introduce Ron Svensson. Uh, the first presentation here yesterday morning, Matthias Goldman mentioned IPCC, the climate report, UN, how everything is not going the right way. And, and uh, Ron is one of the key experts in the world regarding solar energy and I know very much about climate and challenges and those things. So, uh, okay. Please. I just want to take a few minutes to give you a little rundown on what has been going on over in California. Uh, we happen to be working with San Jose State through our nonprofit, the International Institute of Sustainable Transportation. So I'm going to talk about solar powered, automated, rapid transit, ascendant networks. And it just turns out that happens to spell Spartan, which is the mascot of San Jose State University, our uh, football team and so forth, and called the Spartans. Now, as Magnus just said, the COP21, which was in Paris three years ago, set the stage for considering the clean energy revolution. And out of that meeting, all of our leaders around the world said, we're going to shift to renewable energy. But the thing is, how are we going to go about doing that? It's pretty straightforward, one would say, in terms of electricity that we use for running the lights in our room here and the screen and so forth. But when it comes to transportation, it might be a little tricky. However, I want to just point out to you how rapidly things change sometimes. Now, this picture shows the a number of cameras that were built in certain years. If you look at the late 90s on this chart, you will see that we reached a total of about 40 million cameras per year back in the film era. You remember when you had to stick a roll of film in there and if you didn't get it hooked on right, you didn't get any pictures at all and you had to wait a week to see what your outcome was. But then uh, Magnus just today took a picture, one of these little point and shoot cameras. And look at the point and shoot cameras. They went up from the 30, 40 million that people used to have in film cameras. Film cameras dropped down like a stone. Look at that. There's hardly any film cameras anymore. I just saw an ad the other day for a few of them, but uh, it's, a, it's a hard sell. But look at what happened. Somewhere over there in about three or four years ago, the number of point and shoot cameras also dropped like a stone. What happened? Ooh. Let's see here. Whoa. Oh my God. 1.5 billion phones were man I mean sorry, 1.5 billion cameras. I lost I missed my point there. Were were done in the year 2016. 1.5 billion cameras and I I already had the Freudian slip. They were mostly phones at the same time. So that transformed everything in terms of look at you guys. <laughs> I see right there, several people are taking pictures right now. I love my camera, but you know what? It's not handy. It's my cell phone that's right there. And look at you guys. There they are. See, I caught you in the act. Now, another thing that's happened is in the last five or six years, the coal industry, at least in the United States, has collapsed. And what came along was uh, a temporary thing, which was uh, natural gas. We won't see much of that in the future either. But here's another thing. You see a lot of politically motivated projections about the future in solar energy. And all of those lines that go straight across from where they start are the projections of the International Energy Agency or the U.S. Energy Information Agency and so on and so forth. And they say, well, we've come this far, but now it's going to flatten out. And look what reality has done. And I have another slide that I left out uh, because it doesn't work on that computer. But it is showing that the transformation in certain countries, solar is just skyrocketing. And so uh, we talked yesterday about the revolution that took place in Germany a few years ago. And it was because of political commitment that all of a sudden solar really took off like, like gangbusters. So I'm going to talk about the uh, evolution of solar in transportation 
And namely, this is my wife, uh, ex-wife to be more precise, and my son when he was uh, four years old or something. And we built a solar-powered vehicle, pretty fancy. But then a few years later, I raced in the, across the United States in 95, and then with my cousin James here, um, with his help, took a group of students from uh, Darwin to Adelaide in Australia running the solar car race. Uh, James lives in uh, Australia, you see. And <clears throat> then a few years later, I got to talking to the fellow that originally introduced me to, um, to Podcar Concept back in the early 90s. That was uh, Doug Malawicki. And by the way, uh, it was through Doug that I met Christopher here, and the rest is history, as you can see. We're at it here. And Right then, um, Doug bought, got one of his friends to draw this up, what it could like to have a pod car set up with uh, solar panels like so. Then a couple of years later, I've been doing some commercial solar installations. I did this at the, um, at the Plantronics headquarters in San Jose. Many of you people, I'm in Santa Cruz, many of you people have these little uh, Bluetooth headsets. Well, they were the ones that really started that. They had a little money left over, and they did a lot better with their money uh, invested in solar than they would have if they'd put that money into CDs or something like that. And then a few years later, just before our Podcar City Conference in Berlin, I contacted a group of students out of Delft University, and they came up with this illustration of what this could look like in Uppsala. And later on, some students did some work on that. I'll uh, maybe talk about that offline, but in any case, uh, just a few months ago, a group of students from the University of Johannesburg in South Africa did this for the Futran company and showed that uh, a solar panel about six meters wide, if you do the math very quickly, your solar um, array will constitute one megawatt per kilometer. And if you go four, it rolls off your tongue a little easier, uh, a megawatt a mile with a four meter wide solar array. And then in the stations, we would look at a system that might be, say, 10 meters wide. And if you add it all up, you get, like I said, about a megawatt per kilometer. And if we put a station every half kilometer, then that would be uh, 500 uh, uh, kilowatts, therefore 2.5 megawatt hours. You do the math on that and you can easily get something like 20,000 vehicles a day powered by solar in the average location around the world. A little less in Sweden, a little more out in the desert someplace. Um, then if you put say 10 people in a car, wow, that's, that's well over 100,000 people a day. That's about the capacity of a typical uh, advanced metro system. I mean, it could be a little higher, but basically what it comes down to is worldwide average, you could get this done and achieve the kind of capacity you could ever hope for. Now, let's say that's a little bit less in Sweden. Well, if then you could do it here in Sweden, that means that you'd have something to export, export. And going back to what Matthias said yesterday, if, if either Sweden or, let's say, in my case, work, living in California, if Silicon Valley were to become absolutely perfect when it comes to climate change, we're all saintly doing nothing wrong in terms of producing carbon, we would still be a fraction of 1% of uh, the whole world population. So what we have to do is to fix it here and then start exporting like crazy. And if you realize that the number of pod cars it takes to run a worldwide fleet when a vehicle is used 20, 40, 50 times a day and it contains 10 people instead of one, that there's some manufacturer out there that's gonna figure it out that they're not gonna make money by making more of some stupid gadget that weighs two tons and has four wheels Oh my God, what a brilliant idea. Everybody comes to me and says, Tesla, what do you know? Do you know Elon Musk? You know, I'm in Silicon Valley, so I must know Elon Musk. I say, okay, this guy's a genius. He's figured out how to take a box that weighs two tons 
and puts four wheels on it. What an innovator. I'm sorry. We can do better. So, I want to say, first of all, that to, to just carry this theme out, livable cities require livable streets. And I'm going to use streets as a metaphor for humans. Back in the day, uh, 100 years ago, people used to walk on the streets and they had access to the streets. That's uh, just a little example from New York City. And by the way, that vi that's a film you can find on YouTube. It was done in 1911 by a group of Swedish uh, movie people, no less. They came from uh, Sweden and went over to New York and took, uh, took these pictures. So you could dig that one up on the YouTube. So there's a lot of applause for the automated vehicles. And one guy, Tony Seba, at Stanford University has gotten a big name for himself by going around talking about these ridiculous numbers. He says that the 90 to 95% energy efficiency, absolute nonsense. That is just, that's hogwash. And then he says, asset utilization, 80 to 90%. Absolute nonsense, do the math. And then he says 100% autonomous. Well, maybe. But I think we can flip the tables on these guys. Let's see here, wait a second. Oops. Oh, no, wait a minute, that's still not quite right. <laughs> there we go. How's that, is that better? Now look at that. We can make room for people, pedal, pets, pedals, and pedals. How's that? If we just turn the tide on these people, turn the tables. Just like Jesus did, you know, in the, uh, in the Bible. He takes the tables and turns over the money changers and starts chaos. And he lets the uh, cattle out of the, out of the pens and they stampede across all of the money changers. So one of our students, in fact, uh, colleagues of the students here from Southern Illinois University, last January came out and spent some time uh, working with us over the uh, winter holiday. And she came up with this. Okay, this is right down the main part of town. I'm standing more or less at City Hall in San Jose, and that tall building in the left there, uh, up on the up, I used to go there to the dentist when I was in grammar school. I mean, that building's been around since I was a kid, and it's, it's right there at the very center of downtown San Jose. But look, that is a very hostile environment. It's all asphalt. Your students were talking earlier about Houston. Houston is 65% Two-thirds of downtown is asphalt, streets, and parking lots. Two-thirds. What kind of lifestyle is that? So she came up first with, uh, well, let's put in um, a bike path, and let's have a little bit of sidewalk uh, cafe. But wait a minute. That's kind of dangerous. So why don't we put up a barrier there? Well, that's okay, but it's kind of ugly. So how about if we put in some... You know, put in some uh, uh, flower pots or something to make it look kind of nice. And then, oh, by the way, after people get used to the pod car, which you see has a solar array on the top of it there, we could get rid of the cars except for maybe a little bit. And now we have a really pleasant place for humans again. We want to liberate the streets for people. And there's no reason we couldn't go all the way there. And if, by the way, you had to move your piano and it, you needed some space, well then, and it wouldn't fit in the pod car, then you could take a, sh a small vehicle going five miles an hour or less, going the same speed as pedestrians, and take that piano down just like we took the pod out, and then drive off uh, in a street that's more appropriate for freight. But the main goal here is to get our downtowns to be livable again. Why is it that we are madly scrambling to put even more cars and automate them so there's absolutely no space for pedestrians to get between cars. So I think cities can be purpose-built around pod cars, and we'll call those, this is a new term we invented 10 years ago called pod car cities. How about that? Wouldn't that be something? And this, by the way, I owe to uh, PRT Consulting, our friend in, in Colorado, uh, who had somebody do this for him. I don't know who, I'd like to know. So I want to give you a small sample of what solar is now when you go to, to uh, development. We've heard a lot of people talk about 
uh, transit-oriented development. I'm going to talk about solar-oriented develop solar development very quickly. And you see in the upper right there, there are a number of lots that are 25 feet wide. And so we took five of those lots and rearranged it in such a way that all the houses in this location and at 45 degrees north in, in Montana had access to sun. There you see what it's going to look like when they're finished. And that's roughly what it looks like. That was a few weeks ago. We're under construction with these several houses. Now imagine if we liberated our, our homes from the grid of streets. Yeah, we could go at it in a whole different way. Well, we're developing a network and I'm, not gonna, I'm giving up on all the old people in this room, so I'm going to concentrate on your young folks here and say you have a chance to really do something, and you can join us in our real-time, real serious projects doing everything from building homes that I did in the 70s, building the solar race car in the 90s, and doing work with students even now in the program at San Jose State. So I encourage you to uh, get together with us. I have some brochures about this, little flyers. Join the Spartan Superway Summer Internship Program. Our next one will be this coming year in June and July in Silicon Valley. And we're drawing upon students from around the world. We have a network which includes students from Africa, from Europe, from Asia, and we're even starting to do things in South America and, and Mexico and so forth. We've, we've had students from all these different places getting involved. Now, some other time I'll tell you about what we're doing in more detail at San Jose State, but I think I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much.